she is online and ready. Um, first, thanks everybody for joining today. Hopefully we'll have a, a fun hour talking about all things coral reefs and corals. Um, my name is Zach Rago. I um, worked on a film called Chasing Coral where we spent about four years filming and documenting how coral reefs are changing due to climate change, um, and particularly a phenomenon called coral bleaching. We'll talk a little bit about the film as well as coral bleaching today, but most importantly, I wanted to mostly focus on why corals are cool and, and why I enjoy them personally, why I fell in love with them, and um, really what made me think they were so fascinating. So if we're ready to go, I'm going to start going through some slides, and I believe you guys should be able to ask me questions through the chat as we go, um, and I'll just answer them as we kind of chug along. So definitely bring on the questions, and I will get started. So when I was growing up, I grew up in Colorado, but basically as far away from coral or the oceans as you can possibly get. Um, but I was very lucky. I spent a lot of time in Hawaii, and I fell in love with the ocean and fell in love with corals, so much so that I actually started growing them myself as a career when I was quite young. In fact, behind me, I have a lot of my original corals still today. Um, I have about 60 species or so here in my office that I grow. Um, but... Corals are really fascinating creatures. You can think of them as not only an animal, but they also have a plant inside their tissue, and they use energy from that plant to build a rock or their skeleton. So they're kind of a plant, kind of an animal, kind of a rock. But they do some really incredible things because of all of those factors. And one of the things that I think most of us all agree on is that corals can be really beautiful. Um, and I think for me, that was one of the first things that really drew me to corals originally is the quintessential coral reef is just filled with colors, just like the image that's on the screen right now. You've got blues and pinks and oranges and beige and green. They can be really stunning, beautiful locations. And each coral kind of has their own story. So we see a huge variety of different colors when it comes to coral, like these pinks and oranges. Um, they really are magnificent creatures. And if you look really closely on this image, you'll see some of the little tentacles sitting inside of the cups. They look like cups, at least, but they're called coralites. And each one of those little cups has an organism living inside of it. And they're called polyps. This coral right here is probably made up of, you know, a couple thousand polyps that all come together and create a colony. It's a colonial organism. But the colors are never ending. Again, now we have these bright pinks. Um, again, you can see the little holes within the, the coral, and that's where the individual animals actually live. We also get a huge amount of blues in the ocean, which is pretty cool. These are some of my favorite colors. In nature, blue is actually really rare. If you really think about it, not all that much in the natural world is blue. You get bright yellows every now and then. The colors are really, truly endless. But there's a catch here. The little arrow that you can see on your screen now is pointing to an area of this coral where you can actually see what I'm talking about. So all of these colors that corals might be actually isn't the coral at all. If you look at this arrow right here, you'll see a little kind of pattern that's on the coral tissue. And that is something called zooxanthellae. Um, it's kind of like an algae, and it lives inside the tissue of the coral. And that's what you can see here. The little pattern is those algae actually living inside the cells of the coral. Now, you might be wondering, well, why do they even do that? Well, it's actually incredibly important. Algae, unlike us and animals, they photosynthesize. And it so happens that with corals, 
about 80% of their total energy comes from these little algaes that live inside of their tissue. And without them, they can't grow. So this algae is the most important thing for the corals because it provides them the energy to build the skeleton and the structures that you see in this image and in the previous images. Now, before we talk about more structure, I think we have one question in here. And that is, how many species of coral are there? So that's an awesome question. And there are kind of a couple different answers. So reef building corals, or the ones that actually build the skeleton or build our coral reefs, so to speak, there's about 600 or so that actually make skeletons. However, there's a lot more of just all kinds of coral. There are also corals that are soft. Um, they don't do the same thing functionally as the stony corals do. They don't have a skeleton, but they're still really important and they're still really diverse. But for all purposes, for me in Australia, where I usually get to work, there's 400 species on the Great Barrier Reef alone of stony building corals. So they're quite diverse and they all tend to look very differently. And one of the cool things about corals is that every species kind of has its own story and they can all look remarkably different. So I'm gonna play through some slides here that show the vast difference of the structure that they look like because some of them are very, very different. Some of them get huge branches like this coral. This is called an acropora or a staghorn coral. And they can get these huge branches and arms with little points at the top and grow quite large pretty quickly. There are other corals that look like brains. This is called a diploria coral. Um, they look like big rocks on the bottom until you kind of get up close and personal. And then you realize, wow, this has really a crazy structure to it. Um, and actually looks like a brain. Some corals are quite small. This is a, an acanthastria coral. It's probably smaller than your phone. It's quite beautiful, bright orange, um, but super small and doesn't even necessarily have a, a structure like the other two. This kind of just encrusts over other rocks. Then you have things like bubble corals, um, this coral is huge, fleshy mass of, of corals, um, and you can actually see a symbiotic shrimp that's living on top of that coral, which is pretty cool. It's the little things that if you don't pay attention, you'll miss them. We're going to answer some questions real quick. Um, so a question from Mrs. B is, what indicates the color of the coral? So there's a couple of different answers here. Um, but most importantly, it's actually the species of the algae that lives inside the coral. So one of the biggest kind of open ends in, in coral science right now is we don't know as much about the algae that lives inside of the corals as we do the corals themselves. And they're very diverse, these algae, and each of them kind of has a different color. Um, so that's why we get our browns and greens and blues and pinks, is it's all a different mixture, a different combination of different species that actually live within that coral. Now, when corals get stressed, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, then you actually begin to see even larger changes within the color. Um, and I'll stop right there until we get to the bleaching portion of the, the slideshow. But the color is a very good indicator as well about the health of that individual coral. Um, if the color gets more pale, it's not as bright and vibrant, that could be a really good indicator that that coral may be struggling or under stressful conditions. Another question from Mrs. B is, are there any edible types of coral? There aren't any that people commonly eat. Um, Corals fall into a, a family group called cnidarians. That means they share resemblances with anemones, jellyfish, corals. Um, and one of their defining characteristics is they have these little cells called nematocysts. 
Nematocysts are stinging cells. They have, um, you can think of them as little hairs or almost like, um, like little carbon fiber, sort of. And when something comes up and touches them, um, like a fish, they actually shoot those out and kind of grab onto the fish. It's the same reason why we don't want to, you know, just jump in the water with a bunch of jellyfish because they'll probably sting us with these cells. Um, so eating them probably wouldn't be all too much fun because it would probably sting your mouth or sting your insides and um, likely wouldn't feel too great. But there are some cool stories about how coral have been used over time. And one of my favorites are a small soft coral that's very similar to anemones. They're called polythuas. Um, and they carry a toxin called palytoxin. It's a very nasty chemical that can do a lot of damage to people. But there's some really interesting stories throughout history of this exact coral. One of the most interesting is just like Amazonians use poison dart frogs to put on top of um, their spear tips when they're hunting, ancient Hawaiians actually used to use polythuas to rub onto their spear tips and use in the same fashion as they do poison dart frogs. Now, this toxin is also the same reason why when we hear people talk about um, eating puffer fish, having to do it very delicately and having a professional cut that fish because it may kill you if you don't, is because the puffer fish actually eats these corals and stores that toxin in its belly. So if you're ever eating puffer fish, it's very important that somebody that knows what they're doing is the one that's serving it so that they miss out on that, um, that gland that holds this particular toxin. Now, one more story about consumption of corals that I think is interesting, but in old Louisiana culture, things like um, the notion of voodoo and particularly the notion of zombies, there's some evidence to show that polythuas and the consumption of them may have led to this idea of zombies that we have. So people would dilute this toxin down and actually consume it. And what it would do is essentially put the person into a coma for a short period of time. And when they came back to, ancient peoples used to consider this basically coming back from the dead. Um, and that is one of the, the multiple thoughts about how the notion of zombies or people coming back from the dead happened is through polythalas. So I always find that quite interesting. Another question from Alec T. Um, what is the largest coral that I've grown? The largest coral that I personally have grown would actually be this guy right here, the one that is uh, a little blue and kind of large. I've had that coral for, I don't know, about five years, six years or so. Um, and even then, it's only about the size of your average dinner plate. However, I've seen some corals in nature um, that are about 800, 900 years old. And they can be, you know, 10 meters tall and 20 meters wide, um, basically a small apartment of a coral. They can be absolutely enormous. And I think I actually have a picture of that coral um, coming on later in the slides. Oops, hold on. All right. And from Brittany M., what is your favorite type of coral? My favorite type of coral is called a euphilia. Um, I have a couple in here as well. They are that guy right there. So they kind of look like something out of Avatar. Um, they're very fleshy. They look very similar to the coral that's on the slide right now. Um, you know, I just think that they're aesthetically beautiful. I don't have a good scientific reason for them. Unfortunately, in nature, my favorite coral happens to live in pretty mucky water usually. So most of the time I get to see my favorite coral in the natural world. It's usually on a pretty nasty dive, not the most pretty. Um, from Sadie M, how many other species use coral as habitat? That's an awesome question. So coral reefs are what we call the nurseries of the sea. They provide habitat for about a third of all life in the ocean at some point in that life's life cycle. 
So babies in particular, things come to the coral reef to give birth or um, to provide shelter for their young. And so they are hugely diverse and extremely important for almost all life in the ocean because this is the location that so much relies on the corals to, you know, get, get going into their life. Um, and that's what makes what's happening to corals kind of scary. Um, it disallows a lot of these creatures a home for a period of their life. And that can be extremely stressful and can even kill some of the fish that rely on coral or small invertebrates like the little crab on the screen right now. Um, that they're incredibly important and thousands and thousands of species rely wholeheartedly on these corals to survive. Now from sixth grade, Dylan would like to know if it hurts to touch coral. So certain species can have kind of more stinging power than others. Coral in particular probably doesn't sting as much as say an anemone or a jellyfish, but they can still, um, you know, maybe give you a little bit of a rash per se. Um, there is a species of coral called fire coral, which actually isn't a true coral. It's actually something we call hydrozoan, but close enough, and they can actually give you a pretty good sting. doesn't usually hurt your hands. Our hands are pretty tough. Um, we got thick skin on our hands, but if you were to get it, you know, on the softer tissue on the interior of your arm, it can definitely give you a little bit of a sting, but it, it's not going to kill you. usually just gives you a little bit of a welt or a rash. Um, but if you were to get stung enough, it definitely wouldn't feel good. Another question from sixth grade. Audi would like to know if coral reefs are only found in oceans. That's another awesome question. So living coral reefs absolutely are only found in oceans, but coral reefs of the past can actually be terrestrial. Um, in fact, I live in Colorado, and in the state next door to me in Utah, there's a national park called Capitol Reef. Capitol Reef used to be um, a coral reef, very different than what we think of coral reefs today. But when the Midwest of the United States was underwater about 100 million years ago, they actually had coral reefs. And this limestone structure that the reef built is now one of the most beautiful national parks that we have. So we can find them outside of our oceans, but they're ancient and they're no longer living. Riley would like to know if any animals live in the coral. Um, so there are a lot of things that kind of create a symbiotic relationship with corals. Um, one of the best examples is again this little shrimp that you see in the photo that's up on the screen. This shrimp, as well as things like Nemo or anemone fish, they have kind of a protective structure. They produce a kind of mucus on their bodies, and it tricks corals or anemones into thinking it is part of itself. They don't recognize the shrimp or Nemo as potential food, um, and they take care of each other. The shrimp is getting a, a house, a little bit of protection, and he usually is providing a little bit of food for the coral. So both people benefit from the relationship, which is really cool. Symbiosis is something that I find really interesting. And symbiosis is exactly the same as this algae that lives inside of the coral. If it were us, we would be a little green. We'd have algae in our skin. And instead of going out and having a lunch break, we would actually just go outside and sunbathe for a few hours, and that would be our meal. I think that would be pretty cool. So, I'm going to pause on questions for just a little bit and get a little bit farther into the slides, but I will come right back to them. So just some more structural um, you know, photos of how diverse corals can be, particularly in how they look. Um, you can get cups like this, which are really pretty. And you can even get individual corals. So this is actually one coral animal. Um, it's not multiple pups, it's not colonial. This is actually just an individual, which is really cool. And um, we don't actually see these types of corals super regularly. They also happens to be very stunningly beautiful. Now, something very cool about coral is 
the way that you look at them and the perspective of Coral is everything. Um, life lives in the slow lane, and corals look very stagnant. They're essentially rocks on the bottom of the ocean. And unless you pay real attention, you really never get to see them do their thing. This coral, for instance, probably to most people looks like sticks. And it does look like a stick, but this coral actually happens to be the first new discovered species of coral in over 30 years. Dr. Charlie Varin um, discovered this about a year ago. I was lucky enough to be with him. Um, and I, this is the only picture that exists of this coral. I got to take it, which I think is really cool. So I'm kind of proud of that. Now, going back to life living in the slow land, corals are, do all the same things that animals do. This little arrow is pointing out the center of this coral's mouth. Um, this is where they take in food and then they spit it right back out. A coral's mouth is actually the same as its back end. It just eats things, digests it, and then spits it back out the same hole. Pretty interesting, but they do all the things that animals do. They get to eat, they fight with each other, they reproduce just like animals do. There are male and female corals. Um, they do all the normal things that we think of with animals. It's just that they do it much more slow than we are used to. So given a little patience and time watching corals, you can actually see them do all of these amazing things. It's just we have very low attention spans, and we don't tend to take the time to watch the things that um, move much slower than we do. Now, my story gets into what a film called Chasing Ice was. And what Chasing Ice was, and I don't think this video is going to work, but um, a good friend of mine named Jeff Rolowski took seven-year time lapses of uh, ice melting. And what this does is, going back to life living in the slow lane, is it allows us to see something that might be happening over years or a decade, and we can turn that into a small amount of time that fits our own needs, our attention spans. Now, we had an idea that we were going to do this with coral. Um, and an idea is at the core of everything that we do. You have to start with some form of, well, I think this might be really cool, and then go do it. Our idea was to take a beautiful coral reef that looks like this and document it, changing to something like this, where it's bleached, and ultimately taking them to where they actually die. So in this image, you can actually see a little bit of the coral that's still alive, it's a little bit blue and pale, but everything else around it has already begun to kind of disintegrate. You can see the algae growing on the coral. That's a good sign that the coral has, has died. Now, one of the questions that we need to touch on is, so why does coral bleach? So going back to the algae that lives in its tissue, I said that it would be like um, instead of having lunch, we would go outside and, and sunbathe for a little while. Well, if it's too hot outside and we go outside to sunbathe and get our food, it turns out that these algae begin to kind of freak out. They misbehave. They're not doing what they're supposed to. And they actually, instead of producing energy for the coral, they start producing really nasty molecules that harm the coral. Just like what happens with us, if we get something in our bodies that's harming us, let's say the flu, which is going around right now, our body does everything in its power to get rid of it, whether that's blowing your nose or coughing it out or even vomiting. We're trying to get rid of something that's hurting us. Corals do the same thing. They throw all of their color away because the color is what's hurting them, and they turn these bright white colors like this. And in this scenario, like we said before, we've now lost the majority of the energy that the coral needs. That puts them in a very precarious situation. If it doesn't get cooler in the ocean, then they'll essentially starve to death. They don't have that energy source anymore. And this is what we wanted to document. We wanted to document this change and see how corals can actually either recoup or how they actually die. Now, a lot of these images were of the 2016 bleaching event in Australia in which it got really bad. I watched an entire ecosystem essentially die before my eyes. But 
I was able to document it so that I could share it back with the world, which was really important. Here you can see what the reef looks like after it's essentially dead. This is a completely dead reef. Um, this was taken about a year after the bleaching event, but you can see that there is nothing left that's alive in this photo. This little portion of ecosystem has um, collapsed, as we call it. There's nothing really living here anymore. This is another photo, same thing. Huge swath of coral that has now died because of coral bleaching. Now, before we talk about how failure is always part of the process, we're going to go through some more of these questions. Um, I love this question from Naomi. Does coral require a lot of care in an aquarium setting? Um, the answer, the simple answer is yes. Um, I would say that corals are significantly more complicated to take care of than having, per se, a dog. Um, there's a little bit of chemistry that goes into it, uh, making sure your water's always clean and perfect. Um, the lighting conditions have to be very perfect. Um, it is definitely a lot of work, but it's also extremely fun, and it's a huge and amazing learning experience. Um, I've been doing this since I was like 12 years old, and there's still not a day goes by that I'm not learning something from my tank behind me. Mrs. B says, what is the most common coral you see? Um, this is a tough one. Every single reef is going to have its own story. Um, but Acropora, or the staghorn corals, the branching ones, they are kind of the foundation reef building corals. You can think of them kind of as the grasses in a forest ecosystem. They're the very basic species. They grow quite rapidly. They die quite easily. Um, but they're on almost every ecosystem. The Caribbean is a little bit different because their Acropora species are very endangered. So then you get some of the mounding corals, things like um, big boulder corals that we call parietes. Um, they can be very common as well. Uh, I scrolled too much. Give me a moment. Uh, next question from Mrs. B. Do coral reefs ever stop growing, and do they ever rise above water? So corals essentially grow perpetually. Um, there are some corals in the deep, deep ocean that can be thousands of years old. Um, the oldest ones that I've seen have been just about 1,000 years old, and they can get gigantic, I mean huge. But they do basically perpetually grow. They don't have a whole lot of limitations. Um, they can grow for quite a while. Do they ever rise above water? They would never grow themselves above water, but every year there are actually um, particular times like full moons and when we get what we call the king tide, where the tides get really huge, that corals can actually pop above the water for a few hours. I've been lucky enough to see this a couple times, um, and it's absolutely fascinating. And they actually protect themselves from being out of the water. Those acropora corals, the common ones we were just talking about, they actually like build a layer of snot. It literally looks and feels like snot over these corals. And it's kind of like a sunscreen. They, um, they kind of give themselves them, their own water. Um, but it does happen. All right, Sadie M. Oops, hold on. Actually, hold on. Um, Alec T, can you take us on a tour of your tank? We can definitely do that. So I have quite a few different corals in here. So these are some chalice corals as well as a, a, an open brain coral called a trachophilia. Um, you can see right behind it, that's a bubble coral. Got some other mounding corals here. Um, up top, see the branching corals? There is one all the way at the top of your screen and then one kind of central. Those are the species of corals that we find to be the most common for the most part. Um, I also have some gorgonians in here. This is actually a species of soft coral, the one that you can see kind of waving around. It doesn't have a skeleton, but they're absolutely beautiful. And up top, you can see something that most people would look at and think is an anemone. 
that's also a species of coral. It all just happens to have some huge tentacles on it that kind of sweep around. Um, I also have, if we look over here, there's a, a sea urchin, and I keep him in my tank because sea urchins are actually some of the best um, herbivores in nature. They eat a ton of algae all the time, and having one in your tank makes my job a lot easier because he can clean up the tank a lot better than I can. Now, from Kenyon M., what is the most expensive coral in the world? So, it's a complicated question. Um, some corals get traded pretty regularly for things like jewelry. Um, black corals from the deep have historically always been part of, like, the jewelry trade, similar to, like, ivory. They can be extremely expensive. It's extremely illegal. Um, and any time you make something illegal, it, it racks the price up for a black market. Um, so there are lots of corals that, um, you know, can get a pretty penny. But for the most part, when you're getting into those types of corals or those types of prices, it usually means that somebody is taking something they shouldn't be um, or doing something with coral that they shouldn't be. It's an awesome question, though. From Bridget T., how do you make sure that the coral you get in your tank is from a reputable dealer and not taken from the wild? So, this is another great question. There are certain species of coral that we are allowed to take from the wild, and there are certain species that we can't. Obviously, things that are on the endangered species list is a no-go completely. Um, the cool thing about the coral reef aquarium community is that Though at one, the cool thing about the coral reef aquarium community is that though at one point in time, the vast majority were probably coming from the wild, we've gotten good enough at growing them and actually fragmenting them that most things are from kind of a lineage that has been in captivity. One of the cool things about coral, if we go back to the tank, is for instance, I could take this coral and all of those little holes or mouths that you see on it I could actually take a saw and I could cut that coral up into just being individual mouths. So we could cut it up and have, let's say, 200 little pieces and all of those corals would survive. You can then sell them to somebody that else that has an aquarium and it will grow into another coral like this. It might take a long time, but we can share each other our corals. Um, and they're all genetically the same. We can literally cut them into a thousand little pieces and you get a thousand baby corals, which is pretty cool. And it helps us ensure that we're actually doing most of this in our own aquariums and from dealers and not having to take from nature because we can do it ourselves. All right, from Kenyon M, what is your favorite part of your job? So, my favorite part of my job is twofold. First, I do a lot of educational outreach, really similar to what we're doing right now, and I take a great joy in doing that because I get to share my passion for something that I love um, with you guys and with people from around the world. Corals have been in the media a lot the past few years, but before that, they were kind of out of sight and out of mind. Nobody paid a whole lot of attention to them. Um, but I happen to really love them, and the fact that I get to spend time working with them, as well as spend time with other people that share that same passion for corals, that's definitely the best part. And I get to spend time underwater, which I adore, so that makes me happy. Have you ever personally seen the coral reefs at the North Pole? From Lynn M. So all of my work, for the most part, happens on coral reefs in the tropics. So I don't spend a whole lot of time in the cold water, um, which I'm kind of happy about. But there are corals that live all over the oceans. Um, the corals in the North Pole, or in the, the colder water of our planet, are very, very different than the corals that I work on in the tropics, and very different than the corals you see behind me in my tank they actually don't have the algae that photosynthesizes. So you can imagine corals that live in the North Pole, they have about six months where they're not getting a whole lot of light. 
therefore they can't provide that energy. So the corals that live in the Arctic, they actually eat. So that's all they do. They eat things like fish or phytoplankton, and they don't build coral reefs. They are tend to be very small. They're like that. And they're usually just an individual polyp. They don't grow in colonies like the tropical corals do, but they're very interesting. But I have not seen them personally, unfortunately. Maybe one day. Um, from sixth grade, Andre would like to know where the biggest coral reef is today. So the Great Barrier Reef is by far the largest reef on the planet. Um, it's not the most diverse reef on the planet. That would be just north of there in Indonesia. There's a place called Rajampat, which is the single most diverse location on the planet, marine or terrestrial. So more so than um, the Amazon rainforest, it's unbelievably diverse in Rajampat. There's over 600, 700 species in Raja alone, which is absolutely incredible. Um, the Mesoamerican Reef is actually the second largest reef, and that runs kind of the Yucatan Peninsula, all the way from Mexico down towards Panama. So how old was I when I found my love for coral? Um, for coral in particular, probably not until I was a teenager, but I fell in love with the ocean when I was very young, when, you know, I was probably like in third grade, fourth grade. Um, but when I really got into coral, I was probably, you know, a freshman in high school or, um, you know, an eighth grader when I first got my aquariums going and, and kind of began this journey and uh, I just never turned back. I, I really fell in love with them. I, I find them, you know, infatuating. I wouldn't rather do anything else. Um, from Kenyon M, what are the disadvantages of coral? Um, I'm not sure I know 100% what the question is, but corals do have some disadvantages. Um, you know, the biggest one is they are kind of locked in place. They are like rocks in that way. And um, if variables change in that location dramatically, um, that coral doesn't have a whole lot of options. It's um, going to bleach in an attempt to survive, but ultimately it's going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, and, and they can die because of that. But they are incredibly good at what they do. Um, and they're perfectly capable of making a comeback given the right parameters. From sixth grade, Kyle would like to know how fast coral grows. So another awesome question. And again, every coral kind of has its own story. Some of the big branching corals that we talked about can grow pretty rapidly. Um, in fact, they can grow you know, upwards of an inch a month even in some scenarios. And then there are other corals like the big mounds that we talked about. They could grow a centimeter per year. Um, so there's a huge range of how fast things grow and it all kind of depends on what coral we're talking about. But a great question. Um, Kenyon M, in what year was coral discovered? This is a really fascinating question. Um, corals have been around for about 400 million years. In fact, the original corals were in existence before plants were on land, which is pretty cool. However, when humans first discovered coral, we actually defined them as plants. And that would have been in like the 1600s, potentially even earlier. Um, and then eventually we began to delve into, oh wow, these have more animalistic characteristics than they do plants. But originally we thought that they were underwater plants. It's a very good question, thank you. From sixth grade, Ross would like to know if animals attack corals. So some animals definitely um, like to eat corals. Things like butterfly fish, we talked earlier about puffer fish eating corals. There are a handful of species that do eat corals. There's also a particular starfish that eats them called the crown of thorns starfish. Um, they can be really devastating towards corals. Um, in fact, they can actually eat so much coral so quickly they could demolish an entire reef in just a handful of months, even weeks. Um, so they can be a very dangerous thing for coral reefs and um, they can be a big problem. Um, from Vince, 
he would like to know if coral is located in every ocean. Um, yeah, they are. Um, you've got the Caribbean, which has a lot of coral in the Atlantic. The Pacific is filled with coral. Um, the Indian Ocean has a lot of coral, both in Australia and Africa, um, off the coast of India. Um, and then when it comes to the Arctic, like we said, there are corals there, but they're very different than the rest of the corals. Um, JJ would like to know what corals eat. So it's twofold. First, they photosynthesize. That's one means of them getting energy or sort of eating. Um, but they also eat things out of the water. They're eating things like phytoplankton and zooplankton and marine snow. And every now and then they can even eat um, a fish or a shrimp if they come too close and get inside that pot. So they'll really just about eat anything that they can. Very opportunistic. All right, Mrs. B, how deep can corals live? Um, corals that photosynthesize, like the corals that I work on, they can actually get down to, you know, 400 feet, 500 feet even sometimes. And then there are other corals that, again, don't photosynthesize that live even deeper. They can um, really inhabit the entire ocean. Um, I doubt that there's any, you know, at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which is, I think, you know, 37, 38,000 feet. But there are certainly corals that live in the dark, um, you know, at a couple thousand feet or 10,000 feet. Um, they certainly exist. So they, um, they can definitely inhabit the majority of the ocean, but each one kind of does something different. Um, from Shauna C, my eighth grade students are there, oh, from the eighth grade students, are there medicinal uses from coral? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, and we're only beginning to understand what some of those uses are. And that's what makes losing corals such a scary prospect. Um, there are a handful of cancer medications, um, one of which is called bryostatin because it comes from coral bryozoans. Um, there's a couple other cancer medications that are coming from sea fans in particular, um, or gorgonians. Um, but there are so many novel chemistries on coral reefs that we're really just scratching the surface on what their medicinal value could be. But an awesome question, and hopefully we'll begin to learn more about that in the near future. Um, from Amanda, do some reefs grow faster or taller than others? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think we kind of already answered that, but if your coral reef is made mostly of branching corals, they likely grow a lot quicker and a lot taller than other corals will in a short period of time. So depending on what the assemblage is on a reef, um, they all can have kind of their own story when it comes to growing. From Kenyon M, what's the most unique coral you have seen? Um, that would definitely be the coral that I showed the picture of before that I said looked like sticks um, and happened to be a new species. Um, that's as unique as it gets when, when we're talking about corals. Finding something that nobody's ever seen before um, is pretty cool. So that's definitely the most unique one. Um, Kenyon M, what is the least favorite part of your job? Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I always dreamed of being a marine biologist or working with corals um, and thinking it's going to be all happy-go-lucky. But at the end of the day, my job has been vastly focused on how corals are dying and why they're suffering and, and you know, how long we have to save them. And so there's a huge portion of my job that's communicating why they're in um, really big trouble. Um, and while that's extremely important, definitely not my favorite part of my job to watch something that I really love die, but it's part of it and it's extremely important that I keep doing it. Um, it's an awesome question, thanks. Um, another from Kenyon M, what is the longest amount of time it will take coral to restore itself? So this is a big question that has a lot of variables. Um, the way that corals reproduce is really fascinating. They actually all spawn on the same night. So in Australia, this happens in November, it happens on the full moon, and every single species and every coral in the ocean throws its gametes or its eggs and its sperm up into the water column. This now can be carried by ocean currents all over the world. It's the reason why we have corals in Hawaii. Um, you know, Hawaii hasn't always been there. It's um, geologically speaking pretty young. So how did corals get in Hawaii? Well, it's because 
these eggs that might have been shot out in Indonesia can carry with the currents all the way to Hawaii. And therefore, they can actually restore themselves quite quickly. Uh, given five or ten years, you can have a functional ecosystem. That being said, if the ecosystem has been you know, destroyed, you're still losing diversity. And diversity is really important. Some of those corals that grow a centimeter per year, they need a lot more time um, to come back maybe 50, 100 years, hundreds of years. It's very similar to a wildfire. Um, when you have a wildfire, the grasses come back first, and then the bushes, and then the big trees. Um, it's very similar on a coral reef. The very effective corals come back, but some of the other corals that may not be so lucky, it can take a great deal of time for that ecosystem to become what it used to be. Great question. Um, from Brittany M, how are you able to stay positive even though you're witnessing such a horrific event? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and before I answer it, I'm just going to say that um, you guys have such awesome questions that we're not going to continue doing the slides. So um, I'm actually going to backtrack so that at least we can look at something pretty. Um, that way we can continue going through questions. Um, so how was I able to stay so positive? Um, I think it's twofold. So it definitely wasn't easy. Um, it was pretty sad to watch something that, you know, you care for so much and are so interested in to kind of perish before your eye. But at the same time, what I was doing was allowing myself um, an opportunity to share that story and this issue back with the world. And I think that that was a huge driving factor that, um, you know, that kept us going to be able to say, you know what, this isn't about us. It's about the corals. Um, and we're here doing something that nobody's ever done before. Um, and we're doing it for the corals, not for us. Um, so that was definitely, um, you know, our inspiration for, for keeping going was an opportunity to, to share this beautiful place with the world and, and tell people why it's, um, it's in a very precarious situation and needs some attention. Um, Addy would like to know how we can protect the coral. So this is the big question. Um, you know, like me, I, I'm here in Colorado and there's um, you know, not a whole lot that we can all do directly for the corals if we live in the Midwest or in Illinois or in Colorado. Um, but what we can do is protect the ecosystems in our own backyard. Um, the ocean starts at your front door no matter where you live. And if you're protecting the ecosystems in your own neck of the woods or you're being a local voice for the environment and taking actions within your school, within your own community, within your own household, within your own friend group, those are, are super important. And it's the conversation that ultimately allows us to, to make some progress. So. Um, you know, there's an endless list of individual actions that we can all take that ultimately help the corals. Um, but ultimately, I think it's awareness and having conversations and uh, being open with those around us to finding the best answers to our own communities. Um, the answer is going to be different if you're in Boulder, Colorado, rather than in, uh, you know, Townsville, Australia. There is no silver bullet and every community has its own challenges and issues that it can work on. It's a great question, though. Um, from Sunday F, can a coral revive if the environmental factors contributing to the die-off are rapidly reversed? Um, yeah, they can. And we do know what that window is for temperature. Um, most corals have about a month. Um, if those temperatures come back down within that month, they'll stay bleached, but they can actually bring those algae back. Um, they tend to, you know, struggle after the fact. Um, they don't tend to reproduce for a year. Um, th there's lots of things that can go wrong afterwards, but they, um, given about a month, they, they can actually come back for sure. Uh... Velen would like to know, other than sunlight, what else kills coral? 
So there are a lot of different variables. Sunlight and heat are big ones um, that, that can be very drastic across the entire globe at once. Um, but there are also things like nutrient runoff. Um, communities that don't have good management of sewage, for instance, um, can release a ton of nutrients into the water, and that can have a, a harmful impact on corals. Um, that's probably the largest variable. Um, there are still communities that even tend to use dynamite to go fishing, which is um, a bit silly, but it, it does exist in certain areas of the world. Um, but the temperature and that some excess sunlight are definitely the biggest variables that are threatening them. Um, does coral ever get so dirty that someone has to clean it? Um, corals can actually kind of clean themselves, so they can puff up their tissue. So let's say you've got a layer of stuff on a coral. This coral can puff its tissue up and actually kind of move that uh, material off of it. Um, so they're actually pretty good at it themselves. It's a cool question. Thank you. Um, how long can corals live out of water? Um, you know, if you if they're out of water for you know more than a handful of hours, they're probably going to be in trouble. Um, it's really that tidal period that we talked about before. That's probably the maximum that they can deal with is that period where the tide goes out and they're left out of the water. Any longer, they'd probably be in a lot of trouble. Uh, where in the world is the most coral? Um, you know, the Great Barrier Reef is a huge ecosystem with a great deal of coral, but the area that I mentioned before in Indonesia called Raja Ampat, um, that is considered to be the most coral in the world. Um, carrying on M, is coral used for any medical purposes? I'm going to skip that one because we already answered it. Um, how often do you go for research? So. I actually am not a true researcher. I'm not working for a university. I work for a company that made the films that I was in. Um, and I actually mostly get to do educational outreach. So I'm in universities pretty frequently, but once or twice a year, I get to go out in the field and do my thing with corals. So um, a couple times a year, hopefully more. Um, can you fragment coral to repair coral damage in the wild? Is this being tried? Um, yeah, fragmenting coral is one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, most of what we're trying to do is on the genetic side of things. Um, we want to take survivors, for instance, and actually breed them together. If you survive the bleaching event, then it's likely that you have some genetics that actually could be very helpful to us. Um, that being said, it can be quite difficult to, um, to know exactly what's going to work. Um, but right now we're delving into all kinds of different ideas, whether it's fragmenting or mixing up genes. Um, we're doing our best to try all kinds of different um, tactics or experiments to find out more about how corals can, um, can repair damage in the wild. It's an awesome question. Um, what is the biggest threat to coral reefs? Um, yeah, it's definitely the temperature right now. Um, the more and more we hit them with temperature, the less likely they are to be able to recuperate. So temperature is the biggest one, um, and that is largely driven by us. Um, the oceans are a huge buffering um, for our planet, and 93% of the heat energy that's been happening because of global warming or climate change um, has actually been consumed by the oceans, um, and that's having a huge impact on our coral reefs. Um, so one question is how do corals die? Um, you know, they actually are essentially starving to death. Um, it's obviously not the only way to, for a coral to die, but when it gets too hot and they lose that algae, um, it's very straightforward. They, um, they literally are not getting their energy needs. They're not meeting their energy responsibilities and, um, basically they stop. Uh, another one from Kenyon M. What kinds of corals are poisonous? Um, so polythoas are the one that come to my mind immediately. They have a toxin in their body that we already talked about. Um, and those are really the only ones that I would label as you know, truly poisonous or um, toxic would be a better word. Uh, but most of them, they have those stinging cells, but I wouldn't label them as poisonous per se. Um, 
Um, what is my favorite spot to look at corals? Um, I have a couple. When it comes to the Caribbean, I really love um, an area called Glover's Atoll in Belize. Um, but the coolest coral reefs that I've been to and have been lucky enough to work on are in the Torres Strait, and that's the area of water um, between Australia and Papua New Guinea. There's some pretty wild coral reefs out there. Um, hey, would like to know if someone inspired you to research coral. Um, yeah, if you guys watch the movie Chasing Coral, you'll get to meet somebody named Dr. Charlie Varen. Um, and he is kind of like the godfather of coral science. Um, he definitely inspired me to, to love coral and to love taxonomy. Um, and I've been lucky enough to get to know him. But there are a lot of other people, um, scientists that weren't coral biologists or even biologists at all that really inspired me. And those would be like Jane Goodall, Carl Sagan, Richard Feynman. Um, all very famous scientists that uh, I think made me fall in love with the idea of exploration and the scientific method more than anything. And corals um, kind of came after that. Uh, what would it be like if we didn't have coral? Um, it would be a pretty scary world because like we mentioned before, they are truly the, um, the nurseries of the sea. So if we removed the coral, we'd be removing habitat for a third of our oceans, um, as well as a huge community of people that use coral reefs for their own economy. Um, when we look at Southeast Asia, for instance, we're talking about tens of millions of people that rely almost solely on this ecosystem. And if we were to, to remove it, it would impact those communities of people um, in a huge, huge way. They, they may even have to migrate. Um, so if we do lose them, that they, they may even have to migrate. Um, so if we do lose them, that's a, a very you know scary projection is that we could even impact um, communities of people, let alone the vast impacts it would have on the ocean. Um, how does coral affect Earth? Um, I think that we've sort of already answered that, but Really, their role in the, the ecosystem is that they provide habitat for an immense amount of diversity in our oceans. And our oceans are incredibly important. They kind of run the show on this planet. This is a blue planet. Um, and if we remove the nurseries of that blue, um, that's a, a big deal. Um, and it will have big impacts all around Earth. Everything is tied together. Um, what did you study in school that led you to what you're doing today? So this is kind of a funny answer. Um, I actually didn't study coral in college. Um, I have a degree in evolutionary biology and ecology, but I mostly studied plants. Um, so I was kind of a botanist in school and, and not so much a coral biologist. But I always loved corals, but I also went to the University of Colorado. Um, and it's not the easiest thing to study here at the University of Colorado, so I stuck with my plants. Uh, what, oh, um, oops, let's see, Andre would like to know when a coral bleaches, does it harm whatever it's around, such as fish? Um, yeah, so particular fish that rely on corals, some fish live in only one coral colony their entire life. Um, if that coral colony dies, they actually will usually die with them. Um, so after a bleaching event, it can kill a great deal of fish, but there are also some fish that are winners because of those events. Um, corals tend to get covered with algae after they die. So if you're an algae eater, an herbivore, after the coral dies, you're actually kind of having a fiesta. You're a winner. Uh, you've got an unlimited food source and not a whole lot of competition. Um, that's an awesome question, but it definitely impacts things that rely on it. Um, how does coral begin life? Um, yeah, so when a coral reproduces, um, it sends a little egg that floats through the water. Um, and those little baby corals then land on the reef. Um, and they start out as just an individual pop, one little baby coral. And um, they continue to split off and split off and split off until they have a colony. Um, and then you've got a brand new coral that can reproduce itself. It's an awesome question. Thank you. Um, Landed would like to know if there are any corals that can move. Not really. Um, some corals can kind of get blown around and move a little bit, 
but there is one species of coral that does something very cool. It has a relationship with a small, um, a small worm, um, and that worm lives in the bottom of the coral. So it's um, like if this beaker were the coral, there's a worm that lives in the bottom, and if this were the sand bed, the worm actually kind of moves it along like this, which is kind of coral. But it's not the coral moving itself, um, but it's the closest I can come up with. There's another coral called Xenia that doesn't physically move around, but it has little hands that go like this and catch things. So that's kind of cool. Awesome question, thanks. Uh, am I going to keep doing research? Um, yeah, we, you know, the, the entire coral reef community is, you know, really in deep to the coral reefs right now. Um, one of the ironies of a kind of disaster of coral reefs is that it kicks the door wide open for really interesting research. So there's a lot of really cool things going on. Um, and yeah, definitely, hopefully in the near future, I'll get more involved with some of those things. Um, how long does it take for a coral colony to form? Um, yeah, again, every coral is different. I've seen some colonies that are thousands of years old, um, and there are some colonies that are a year old, three years old. Um, I would say for it to be considered a colony, it probably is within that first year of going from a single little pop um, into uh, maybe a coral similar to what you see on the screen. Um, Bellin would like to know how you find out the age of a coral reef. Um, so we can make an assumption just based on size sometimes, um, but we can also take cores of coral. Um, they're very similar to trees. Trees have rings that you can count that grow as they get older. Corals actually do the same thing. As they layer um, calcium in their skeleton, they actually leave behind little rings as well. And so we can take a cross section and we can actually see how old they are. We can also see a, a good deal about their history. We can see if there were big rain events or sediment events or whether it got hot. Um, there's a lot that a coral coral can tell us, which is really cool. But they are kind of like trees. We can tell their age by cutting them open. Um, from Diana S. What do you do when you're not exploring coral? What are your some of your favorite hobbies? Um, well, I, I do like my coral tank. That's one of my biggest hobbies. Um, I'm also a die-hard Colorado sports fan, so I like hockey. Uh, I like the Colorado Avalanche. I like college sports, college football, go buffs. Um, those are probably my biggest hobbies. I like doing my aquariums. Um, I do a great deal of work with um, youth, so I'm always in schools doing things like virtual reality and giving presentations. and. Um, getting kids stoked about the ocean because the ocean's awesome. Uh, Daniela would like to know where does the bleach from the coral go? Um, so bleaching is just a term to describe when the coral loses its algae. What happens is it leaves behind its tissue, which is actually transparent. Coral doesn't really have color. Um, and we call it bleaching because the bright white skeleton underneath can now be seen with that transparent tissue. And because it's bright white, that led us to deem it as, um, as bleaching, because bleach turns things white. But it actually has nothing to do with bleach itself. It's just a term. Thank you, though. That's a good question, good clarifying question. Uh, what do humans do that cause the greatest threats to coral? Um, yeah, it, it's our overuse of... Um, Things like fossil fuels, overconsumption of things like plastics and food um, that lead to greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide or even methane. Um, those things warm the planet. It's kind of like putting a blanket around us. Um, and when it gets too warm for the corals because of that, um, it's definitely threatening. So it's, uh, it ultimately is our emissions of um, greenhouse gases. Uh, from sixth grade, Jericho would like to know how long coral lives. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite questions because corals don't really have a life expectancy. Um, they're all genetically the same within a colony, and they continue to bud off. It's kind of like your cells. Your cells go through mitosis. They start as one, and they split into two. Corals do the same thing, and they're kind of building blocks for the coral, and they continue to do that. So they're kind of always regenerating. Um, so in theory, they don't have a life expectancy. They kind of live forever. Obviously, 
sometimes they die because of other factors. Um, but yeah, they don't have a life expectancy, which is pretty wild. Uh, what is the most common species of coral? I think we already answered that. It's usually a crop rose, um, similar to the species that you see on the screen. They're also the most diverse. There's about 180 species of a crop rose, whereas most corals, there's only a handful of species. Uh, Adi would like to know if there are certain species that are only in a specific region. Um, yeah, absolutely. Everything in the Caribbean only exists in the Caribbean. Um, and only in the Atlantic. So the species we see in the Atlantic do not exist in the Pacific, and the species that exist in the Pacific don't exist in the Atlantic. Um, and it can go as far as there are some species that only live on one particular reef. Um, like as far as we know, this coral that's on the screen only lives in one particular reef in Australia. Um, so there are definitely species that can, um, that can be very, very hard to find or only in one little neck of the woods. Uh, do the colors attract fish? Um, that's a good question. We don't know the full answer, uh, but it's definitely possible. It could be similar to butterflies. Um, some fish could see into the UV range. We can't see it, but like butterflies, for instance, Flowers have kind of UV signs on their petals that we can't see, but a butterfly sees them kind of as an invitation. So it's possible corals can do something similar to that, but we don't know. Uh, from Maggie, would you like, would like to know if it is possible to have fish in an aquarium with coral? Yeah, you just have to have the right fish. Um, I personally don't have fish in my tank because I only like the coral. I kind of think fish are boring. Um, but there are definitely fish that, um, that get along with coral, and sometimes they can even help them. Um, I think we're getting to the last of the questions here, and I don't know if I'm way over time or not, but it looks like everybody's still logged in, so I'm going to keep chugging along. Um, does coral bleaching or death of coral affect tourism? Um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, some of the work that I did in Australia gave me a pretty bad rap with the tourism industry. Um, we made a film talking about how the Great Barrier Reef is, um, you know, has become quite damaged, and um, that type of reputation can impact the amount of people that go there. Um, in Australia, tourism on the Great Barrier Reef is a huge deal. It employs um, tens of thousands of people and brings tourists from all over the world every year. Um, so if people think that it's completely dead, which it's not, um, it, it's been hit very hard and has seen a lot of death, but there are still some very magic places. Um, it's very worrisome for tourism um, in Australia because um, it, it's a huge economic value. And if that stops, um, it'll impact them in a huge way. It's a great question. Um, how often does coral eat? Every night. So during the day, they're photosynthesizing, and then at night, their polyps open up and their tentacles come out and they feed on things that are flying around at night. Um, so they eat each night and they photosynthesize during the day. Um, how do you know if a coral is sick? Um, yeah, corals get diseases all the time. Um, in fact, there's one currently happening in the Florida Keys and in the British Virgin Islands. Um, and we don't even know what it is yet, but it's destroying a bunch of corals and scientists are working pretty rapidly um, to try and figure out what this disease is and how we can stop it. Um, sometimes they're funguses, like um, things like black band or white band disease, um, but diseases do happen, as with everything. Um, all right, I think oh, we've got a couple more. Uh, what does coral do to help us? Um, yeah, again, they provide us um, economic value. Um, they provide us with medicines, they also provide us with tourism. Um, they're also stunningly beautiful. So they provide us in an ecological way, they provide us in an economic way, um, and I think more importantly than all of them, they, um, they're absolutely beautiful and um, I think they bring a lot of people joy um, and, and that goes a long way. And I think think that we are done. So thank you guys so much um, for for having uh, having me and um, this was really fun. You had awesome questions, really stoked. 
if um, any of you are going on to watch David Vaughn in the next presentation, he is also awesome. Um, so I'm sure he's going to be going into uh, some of the same stuff that I do, but he does um, a lot of planting coral himself. So he is definitely a, a coral hero of sorts. But at that, thank you guys so much. Um, really enjoyed um, in chatting with all of you today and uh, have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Zach Rago logging out. Thanks guys.